everybody. This is American Nana. I hope you're all doing well today. I have come to you with a case that it's just so eerie that it is in Florida. It is another woman. This one killed her husband and she has gone through different phases of um, claiming, let's see, battered spouse syndrome, self-defense, possibly anxiety that made her kill her husband and reminded me so much of Sarah Boone after seeing Sarah's display of an attempt to say the same. Difference is this young lady's trial was much quicker and also uh, wasn't wasn't heard by as many people, which amazes me because uh, she's in the Navy. Her husband that she murdered was actually in the Marine Corps but had been discharged due to um, medical. He had a um, traumatic brain injury and he was a hundred percent disabled from the military. And what that means is for the rest of his life, he would have gotten an income from that and uh, medical. Whether she stayed in the military and retired or not, he was guaranteed that because of his service. So uh, when you hear the um, defense attorney talking about how she's the main breadwinner and basically Colin did nothing. Well, I guess that's up to people to think about, right? Because she was active duty. He was going to school. He watched the children while she worked and probably while he did his school work because she seemed to have a whole lot of issues. Now, in finding the trial, there is nowhere that I can find day one, part one. Nowhere. I, it, yeah, if anybody can find that, let me know. I've looked everywhere, everywhere. But what I do have is the opening statements, and I think it's important to start with that. So I'm going to try to do so. I have attempted to do this a few different times. And for some reason, I'm struggling with um, when I sit here looking like I'm going to sleep because literally I'm having a hard, hard time just sitting here quietly while this plays. So if you notice that uh, my little my little cows come up every now and again, um, you know, I may have to actually stand up and walk around so I don't get sleepy. It doesn't take much for me to get sleepy when I sit down and do nothing. It's, it's very odd. Anyway, I don't want to just keep on rattling. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope you enjoy this. And I hope you leave your opinions. I have a lot of opinions myself and will vocalize them. Not sure if I'm going to vocalize them a whole lot during the videotaping or save it for later. Mm, I may go on a rant. You may just have to skip it, skip the rant to get to the, you know, because sometimes I get long winded and there's a few things in here that really bother me. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say I'm going to hush and we're going to turn this over to the attorneys and we're going to listen to the opening statements and see what we think of the situation. So I do have this on 1.25 speed. Um, hopefully it's not too fast. If it drags too slow, I may go to 1.5 please know that you have the ability to adjust that yourself and let me show you how let me get this up on the screen what did i just do oh huh you know i tend to hike one of my eyebrows up a whole lot 
don't know why. All right, so it's real easy. This right here where it says settings, that allows you, if you don't know, to adjust the speed. And um, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and start this off at uh, 1.25. If I feel I can take it any faster, I will. Um, this is a completely different um, court than I've ever seen. The judge does not stand when the jury comes in, which I've never seen that. So, but he seems to be a very nice judge. Now he was, um, <clears throat> he was placed in office, I believe, uh, the same year that she committed the murder. And, um. Uh, let me see. Um, I think it was in 2021 that uh, that he was he was put in his position, and to me that's fairly new for a judge. There's uh, so much that goes into being a judge. I'm sure that for the first I don't know five years, ten years, you're just really getting your feet planted. But he seems to do a good job. And uh, let's let's take it from here. Let's go. Okay. Because on September 8th, 2021, defendant, Bree Kuhn, locked her husband. I'm sorry. Let me just say, this is exactly how it starts off. And I believe he's like saying good afternoon again. Um, although we didn't, there, there, I don't know what happened. Like I said, this is what I found. So. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today because on September 8, 2021, defendant, Bree Kuhn, locked her husband, Colin Turner, in the garage of their home. Colin then called 911 for help. As he's on a recorded phone call with 911, the defendant opens the door to their garage and shoots him four times in the back while he's on the phone. Now, Anticipate this week, you'll hear a lot about their relationship, their marriage. They've been married for several years. They had two small children together. They had a uh, young boy, four years old, and John Patrick, called him JP. And they had a three-year-old girl named Lane. Uh, Ms. Kuhn also had a 12-year-old uh, daughter in a previous relationship, uh, Kyla. So Brie and Colin have the three children, two of them together. Uh, one is just a breeze. At the time of this incident, Ms. Kuhn was in the Navy. She was a chief, and she was working full-time and was acting as the primary breadwinner in the relationship. Colin was a retired Marine who was in school at the time. I believe he was studying engineering. And he primarily, primarily was a stay-at-home dad with the two small ones, the three-year-old and the four-year-old. That was the dynamic of their relationship. And as happens in many relationships, I think you'll see that there were frictions between the different requirements for a working full-time parent and a stay-at-home parent in a relationship person. <clears throat> On the day of the incident, September 8th, 2021, you're going to hear that law enforcement went out multiple times to their residence that day to see and hear both the defendant and Colin speaking with law enforcement about what is happening. Eventually, you'll see both of their perspectives. <clears throat> so, around uh, one o'clock or twelve fifty-four, to be precise, the defendant calls her home. She says that her husband has thrown her down. The sheriff's office sends out two units: deputies uh, Stephen Quick and West Hartberg. As they arrive, Colin is sitting outside, and you'll see all this on the, on the podcast. So Colin is sitting outside on the edge of the driveway in a little fishing chair or lawn chair, and the defendant is inside. And so the two deputies go and speak with them separately. So uh, Colin tells the deputies, you know, the, deputy, the deputy's asking, you know, why, why are we here? Why, why, are we calling, why is she calling 911? And Colin starts to tell him, give him some sort of background about some of uh, the defendant's mental health problems, you know, suicide attempt he had him. I'll come back to that. But then he talks about the more recent problems, and he says, basically, this started last night. We were, you know, uh, sort of arguing. She was wanting to watch the television late at night, and she kept turning up the volume, and I was asking to turn it down. 
and have a back and forth. She, she wanted to watch the, the TV at a high volume. So eventually says, I disconnected the Wi-Fi, so she could watch the TV. And then he says, no, then she put my laptop in the dishwasher. And you'll see it's kind of sort of petty back and forth. Um, and the relationship, you'll see the relationship is not in a good state at that point. So, um, and then he says, you know, she took my credit cards. Obviously, you know, he's not the breadwinner of the relationship. Um, and he says, I just, I just want to leave. I want to take the kids. I just want to go to Georgia to my parents. And that, as you'll see throughout the course of the trial, that was the thing. He wanted to leave with kids. She didn't want him to take kids. And he, and he tells them, look, you know, I would just leave, I would, but I don't want to leave the kids here with her. So, now the deputies go in and they talk to the defendant. And first, you know, first thing she says, and really every time the first thing she says is, he's going to take my kids. And normally she says, my kids, not our kids, my kids. He's going to take my children. He wants to go to Georgia. And she then tells the deputy basically what she had relayed on 911. That he pushes her uh, up against the doorway and pushes her down in the bathroom. The and the deputy's asking her, uh, Debbie Harberger, do you have any marks, any redness, anything like that? Anybody see it? Also, please know that the background noise is not me. It is in the court. And um, you're also going to have bad, absolutely horrible background noise when they do her interview at the police station because they have a space heater on. And I think at one point, the defense even complains about the noise. But it was because of his client, there was noise because they needed a space heater because she was cold and they were trying to make her comfortable. I didn't realize when you commit such a heinous crime, we're going to be totally concerned about your comfort. But they are. That's their job. Basically, trying to seek some kind of corroboration um, as to what happened. And if she doesn't have any marks, she's unable to give any corroboration. No other witnesses. Also, you've got the, you know, the two little toddlers running around. <clears throat> and so you'll see during the course of this conversation, she's saying, you know, taking my kids. He pushes me down. And then she adds in, you'll see it on my hand, as almost sort of a side comment. She says, he raped me over the weekend. You'll, you'll see the Debbie Hartberger either didn't catch it or didn't even acknowledge it, you know, because she's talking about this pushing incident. And she just sort of adds this part. But I think you'll see during the course of the conversation, her main focus is, he's taking my children. And so the two deputies explain to both parties that this is a simply, as for the children, they can't get involved. And they're legally married. They're the biological parents of both children. They explain to both parties, we cannot stop either one of you from taking the children. <clears throat> you'll see on the body cams, that again, Colin, he's sort of sitting outside on the driveway in the garage. Then it comes out, and you've got the two trucks in the, uh, in the driveway. With Colin's red truck, I can't remember what kind of truck, and her uh, white traverse. You see on the body cam, uh, the defendant comes out, and she starts unloading uh, items from Colin's truck into her own. Because she says, I'm leaving, I'm taking the kids. And you see, she gets out uh, while car seat and is putting in hers so that she can leave with the children. And that's what she's telling the deputies. So both parties are wanting to leave with the children. <clears throat> You'll also see, um, I believe, right before the police arrived, you're going to see a uh, cell phone video the defendant took. And um, some of it's hard to hear, because obviously, especially towards the end, it looks like she's got the camera sort of down by her leg, the view sort of upside down, showing the back of her leg. She's talking with Tom. And you'll hear there back and forth. And at that point, she seems upset about that he won't talk to her. Why won't you talk to me? Why won't you talk to me? He's responding, you know, I tried to talk to you last night, and he doesn't raise his voice, he doesn't yell, he just sounds sort of fed up. I tried to talk to you, and this um, and this sort of a, you'll hear their back and forth. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that this is her recording him. He's not yelling, he's not angry, he's just saying, it doesn't sound like he wants to talk to her. <sighs> so the police leave, and um, shortly after that. She locks Colin outside. He's outside in the driveway. He calls her and ends up speaking with her uh, naval commanding officer. You'll hear from him. And he tells them, she's cut off all my finances. I have no access to any of the money. And um, 
the defendant speaks with him as well. It's a man named Craig Forehand. He was with the uh, commanding officer of the Navy. So he speaks with both parties. He's going to tell you, so both of them, they both seem calm, they both seem rational, and they were both expressing frustration. Colin is frustrated that she's cut off finances. She's talking about him taking the kids. And you'll see that his level, he, his level of concern was fairly low. The both parties seem to that. So anyway, Colin's down the driveway. At some point, Lainey wakes up. The defendant takes the three-year-old girl out to Colin. You got to calm down. She's calm. She's cramped. So Colin now has a uh, three-year-old Lainey, but again, she won't let him back in the house. So now he's outside in the driveway, his three-year-old child. It's September, it's hot. She won't let him back in the house. So now Colin calls 911. 4.58 p.m. He calls 911 and says, my wife has locked me out. I'm out here with my three-year-old dog. You'll hear her here, hear her. Well, I was gonna say in the background, but it's on the foreground really. She's crying, she's upset, and he's trying to calm her down. So police and police respond again. Deputy Jameson Lynn responds. And again, he has conversation with both parties. You'll see he sort of bounces back and forth between them. And eventually, like you'll see his interaction with both of them. Colin relates to him what I just told you. I'm, you know, this is a continuation from earlier. I'm locked out. She won't let me in my own house. And he explains to Colin, it's your house. However, you, you need to get in. You can't. You can break into your own home. You can't be locked out of your own home. Then he speaks to the defendant. And again, the first thing she says is, he's taking my kids. She then relates the incident that she, uh, she had talked about earlier, him pushing her down. And you can tell she's frustrated. Because multiple times she says, he told me not to talk to her. He told me not to talk to her. <clears throat> and the deputy uh, is explaining to her, you know, you can't lock him out. He lives here. He has a right to get into the house. Same, you know, similar with the children. <clears throat> He has a, both of them have a right to children, both of them have the right to the house. And he's trying to, again, you'll see their interaction. Um, what I think you'll see is she's frustrated. She's, you know, the police aren't helping. Again, they can't, you know, they can't keep somebody out of the house. Um, and she's frustrated because he won't talk, you know, Colin won't talk to her. And again, he's taking her kids in her mind. He's taking my children. And Deputy Lynn tries to sort of propose some compromises to her, but she doesn't really seem interested. So um, and eventually, she agrees to let him in the house, and Deputy Lynn parts the same. Shortly thereafter, now she locks him outside in the garage. This time without him. So he's out in the garage. She's inside the residence with the three children. So Colin again calls 911. Says, the "Guy's been acting twice already. And now I'm locked in the garage. My wife won't let me in the house." He says, you know, she, she broke the doors, and then when I came out here to try and fix the, the garage doors, she locked me out. I can't get back in my own house. And you'll hear his tone, how he's speaking. He's, he's calm. He's not shouting. He's not yelling. He's not cursing. He's very calm. He's very rational. He sounds probably more exasperated than anything, the whole situation. And then you'll hear, as he's talking, literally in mid-sentence, you hear a loud bang. And it's shocking. And it's suddenness to the point that the 911 operator asks, you know, you can tell how surprised she is. She asks, what was that? Because there's no context. A calm, rational conversation, then bang. What was that? She asks. And Colin has just enough time to say one more sentence before he's like that. He has just enough time to say, she just shot me. And then you hear bang, bang, bang. Quick succession. The line stays open. The 911 operator is trying to get a response from Colin. So are you there? So are you there? Just please respond. There's no response. <laughs> Eventually, about five or six minutes later, right, right towards the end of the call, you hear the defendant. She leaves after shooting her husband. But a few minutes later, comes back. She says to try and render aid. Colin was well beyond help at that point. She made sure when she shot. You'll see his injuries. You hear the descriptions of his injuries. The physical evidence is going to show you that Colin is sitting in the garage on this little Yeti cooler. 
probably about eight or ten feet from the door, you'll see the pictures. Sitting there on this little Yeti cooler, we'll be back to the door on the phone with 911. Very easy target. You'll see where she shoots it. One shot hits in the upper back, comes out of his neck, ends up in his wrist. Two more right in the back, exit through his chest. Another one right in the back, is recovered from his chest. You have both the lungs and the heart. He made sure what she was doing. He's sitting there on easy target. But it would seem that a short time later, reality set in. She probably realized what she had done. I just killed my husband. She goes back to try and help him. He was very lucky to go. <clears throat> she goes to the neighbors, takes her children to the neighbors, and you'll hear about her interactions there. <clears throat> and obviously deputies swarm to the scene. Obviously, they know exactly what happened. Colin was on the phone. So a huge amount of deputies start showing up, and you hear the defendant is making statements, I shot my husband. She makes a statement of, he was going to take my kids, I shot my husband. That was her reasoning. Yeah. He was taking my kids. Her kids. <clears throat> you'll see uh, on the body cams, and you'll see, you know, right after, she looks, you know, she looks like it. she's in shock, she's kind of standing weird. And like, reality is set in as to what she just did. She just killed her husband for no reason while he's sitting there with the So <clears throat> she is taken to the major crimes unit where she is interviewed by Detective Rao and Detective Cap. And you'll see uh, her recorded interview. Um, I will say that it was cold in there. They had the you know, AC blast in those, in those offices. And so they bring in a little space heater for her. Um, unfortunately, the space heater is very, very loud. And so for the first, I would say, 12 or 13 minutes, um, she's hard, She's a little hard to hear. She's kind of soft-spoken, and the space heater is blasting. Eventually, they turn it off. But you can't hear it. But I will say, for the first time you listen to it, you may not pick up everything she says. But I do want to um, advise you that all evidence that is admitted, you know, body cams, pictures, number one calls, physical exhibits, everything that is admitted, you will get to take back with you in the jury room when you do it. So please don't be concerned if you didn't catch something or if you didn't hear something. Like I said, that, especially that first portion, you may need to listen again if you had to hear it. But you can't hear it. So she starts out with them, basically running through, you know, the sequence of the day, police came out, he pushed me, he pushed me to the ground. Um, she says, you know, I locked him out so he wouldn't take my children. Um, and she says, you know, police came out again, I let him back inside, <coughs> I locked him out in the garage. And then they're asking her about, you know, what happened when you are coming. Her version at that point is that I went to the door, he tried to force his way in, he was kicking me. They have this physical altercation. She says, he was going to kill me. So I shot him as he's coming at me. Now, detectives, they've heard the 911 call. They know exactly the circumstances of how Collins killed. And it certainly wasn't during a physical altercation while he's kicking her and coming at her. That's what she tells him. <coughs> they ask her, they continue to ask her questions, and you'll see that, especially towards the end, a lot of the questions she does not want to answer. She either sidesteps, jumps completely. You'll see probably four or five, five, five times they ask her, what, what was he doing when you went out there? Where was he standing? What was he doing? Did he have anything in his hands? Every time, she... Ducks the question. Now you will see why she ducks the question. Because Callum is sitting there with his back to the door. With an arm she can't tell the police that. <clears throat> so she keeps just dodging the question. Because in her version, he's attacking her. Detective Rowell asks her, why did you go out there with the gun? And obviously she had the gun when she went to the door. She, she says, I just wanted to go. She just, he was locked out. She's inside with the children. She did not have a good reason for going to the door. But we know the reason. She went to the door to kill Colin. So I'll ask you to contrast her versions, her testimony, her statements, 
with some of the physical elements in the case. And you'll see there is a huge chasm between what the evidence shows and the version that you want to call. <clears throat> now that is the bulk of the state's case. And the state will show that she killed her husband with premeditation. Now once that happens, I will rest. And at that point, the defense can present evidence if they so choose. And if they don't have to, as we like we talked about yesterday. And typically, I don't comment because I don't like to talk about things that I don't control. However, in this case, I feel very confident that the defense will call at least one witness. So as we talked about yesterday, I expect the, the defense will call Dr. Julie Harper, psychologist. And she met with the defendant probably half a dozen times over the course of several months. And the defendant gave her the detailed stories about a great variety of topics. And Dr. Harper is then going to relate to you some of these things the defendant told her. And they're going to be quite shocking to hear. Because the things that the defendant is saying about her husband are terrible. They're hard to hear. She's telling Dr. Harper, and Dr. Harper will then relate to you, that Colin has been raping her. He put the, put the dog through the drywall. He's threatening to drown all the children. That he wants to kill his wife so that he can murder all these children. Some of the logic gets a little hard to follow, honestly. But um, just really shocking stuff that may elicit an emotional response from you. It's, shocking allegations. Two things important to keep in mind. A, what is the source of all those allegations? And what you'll see is that it's simply her telling the doctor all these things that happened. Now we'll see with Colin gone. There's nobody to contradict her versions. Commander, can we approach? No. So you'll see that the source of all these stories is what the defendant is telling Dr. Harper. Dr. Harper would then relate to you. The evidence will also show that there is no verification or documentation for any of this, any of these allegations. This is what she's telling Dr. Harper. Now, I also expect um, that Dr. Harper will talk about sort of the defendant's history, and the evidence will show that um, Ms. Kuhn has a long history of depression and anxiety going all the way back to when she was a child, including uh, her first suicide attempt at the age of 13. Obviously, all of these issues predate her relationship with Colin. And Dr. Harper will talk about uh, the issues she faced uh, in the lead-up to what happened. we will hear about that in April, uh, Ms. Kuhn attempted suicide and was admitted for about, I think about 10 days at that point, to a psychiatric hospital. And then the following month, she was admitted again, like this time for about seven days. This time it was not a suicide attempt, but it was, she went to the ER uh, with suicidal ideations. And you'll see that at these times she's reporting sort of the stressors that she has in her life, which primarily seem to do with work. She's had a lot of issues at work, and she also blames Colin for interfering at work Sort of talks about that, you know, she's being hazed and uh, he calls about that she's working three hours. 
when he's causing troubles, she feels that he's ruining the reputation that she's built for her work. So all these, you'll see all the reasons for these psychiatric hospitalizations, the suicide attempt, no point does she ever report any kind of physical abuse, sexual abuse, threats to the children, anything. Again, she is in therapy multiple times a week. She also relates to Dr. Harper, and I expect Dr. Harper will convey to you her version of what happened with Colin. When she came. And you'll see that this version is radically different. Now she claims that she went out to the garage with a gun because she intended to commit suicide. She tells Dr. Harper that uh, she put the gun under her chin. Colin gave her a thumbs up while he's on the phone. And she was so shocked by his nonchalant attitude that she lowered the gun in surprise and then accidentally shot him right in the back. She then claims that Colin said, you're fucking dead. He charges at her. She shoots again. <coughs> yeah, the evidence is going to show that this is a radically different version than what she told the police and is radically different than what the physical evidence shows. <coughs> the evidence is also going to show you that Dr. Harper did not really attempt to question her or challenge her on any of these discrepancies or changes. And what you'll see is that Dr. Harper simply accepted everything that we told her. <clears throat> you also hear from, or I anticipate you'll hear, uh, from the defense brother. He's going to tell you that he was on the phone with his sister during this incident. He's going to relate to you that he heard Colin attacking her, Colin assaulting her, Colin kicking her, and that he then hears gunshots. Again, you'll have an hour more recording of what happened. And so you'll be able to compare the two and make up your own minds. <clears throat> After that, uh, the state will go into what we call rebuttal, where which is the state gets to address evidence the defense has put on. So at that point, the state will also call the psychologist, Dr. McDonald, like we talked about yesterday. And again, similar to Dr. Harper, she reviewed your medical records. Uh, from both the civilian hospital and the military hospital. She met with uh, Ms. Kuhn on uh, numerous occasions, and she will relate to, to you her conversations with Bree Kuhn. <clears throat> she also talked to Bree about what happened, and she basically told her, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, at this, this point, she said, I'm not really sure what's real and what's not. But she still thought she shot him in the chest. But she didn't seem to, at that point, she seemed to complain to not remember what happened. So you see the progression in her stories. Then you'll see uh, Dr. McDonald will also talk about, as well as Dr. Harper, they both kind of talk about Madden's spouse syndrome, what it entails, characteristics, and how it applies to self-defense, and how it applies to free kicking. And as you might guess, you know, I anticipate that Dr. Harper will say, yeah, she's a bad spouse. <coughs> Dr. McDonald will say, in her opinion, she's not consistent with a bad spouse. <clears throat> I anticipate that either Dr. Harper or Dr. McDonald will tell you about some of the characteristics about his spouse. You'll see that many of them were not consistent with Brie Kuhn's either behavior or situation. A typical component of a spouse is that a person can be helpless to exit the relationship. They don't have a way out of the relationship. So I'm going to relate to you. You'll see in Brie Kuhn's situation that she absolutely had a way out. She claimed she would have had a meeting with divorce attorneys the following day. She told multiple of the deputies that. She absolutely had a way out of the relationship. The doctors will also tell you about another component of a battered spouse is can be financial. The, the, the battered spouse is financially uh, relying upon their abuser. That was not a great situation. She was the breadwinner. The doctors will also relate to you. That's another uh, common component of a battered spouse is that the abuser will isolate the victim, cut them off. They don't have you know friends or family or options, nobody to turn to besides their abuser. A common component about his spouse. And that was not the evidence to show you that is not the situation that Breaking was in. She had plenty of family. She had plenty of support. She had a uh, military. She was in therapy. All these things you can look at in terms of what can what consists about his spouse. And obviously the doctors will give you their opinions. I anticipate Dr. McDonald will give you her opinion. She's not about his spouse. But again, as Mr. Athrey said yesterday, is proving a negative to be negative. So she's not going to give you a definitive answer. Because she's not there. 
the evidence will show that both doctors examined Riku and reached different conclusions. But Dr. Harper, I would ask you to pay close attention to a lot of things she says and how she says them. The details matter. The state will also call likely several other witnesses that will um, mostly law enforcement that talk to Colin that day, and you'll see the body cams of their interactions with Colin. <clears throat> I anticipate that will take most through Thursday. We'll see how, how they can different judge these things. But that's what I anticipate. <clears throat> Ms. Keenan is charged with one count of first-degree premeditated murder, as the judge explained to you. <clears throat> On Thursday or Friday, we will go through the elements of that charge, the things the state has to prove. It is important to note that, as Mr. I think after, as we both said yesterday, battered spouse syndrome is not a defense in and of itself, but it's as it relates to self-defense. The judge will give you the self-defense instruction, and obviously we will discuss it that way. You're going to hear from a good number of witnesses during this trial. You hear from some of the neighbors who had contact with the defendant. You hear from law enforcement who showed up at the scene. You hear from 911. You hear from the medical examiner, detectives. Uh, you will see. A large amount of video, body cams, we'll give them our calls, pictures. Um, again, all the physical exhibits you have to take back with. So, um, as with any trial, it's important that you pay attention and the details will matter. Now, um, it's important to note that um, as we go into closings on Friday, so we'll wrap up everything, and ultimately it'll be your decision. What the evidence is going to show you is that. As this relationship broke down, the defendant, the primary concern was he's taking my kids. And Colin had flat out told her, because of all these psychiatric issues and you attempting suicide, Cal City Battery was not going to go wealthy. He knew that. And she knew that if he takes those kids to Georgia, well, she will see them again. That was her driving motivation that day. She's going to lose her kids. The evidence will show she locks him in the garage, shoots him in the back while he's on the phone with 911. Not in self defense, not without justification. She murdered her husband. The evidence will show that since then, she's been attempting to justify what she did and explain and give reasons for that 911 call. She can't do it. The evidence will show this was not an act of self defense. Exactly, the premeditation and murder those. So I'll ask you to find the defendant guilty of first degree premeditation. Thank you. Mr. Etheridge? <coughs> May please, court. Good morning. How y'all doing? Thanks for coming back. Sometimes after jury selection, people listen to me for a while and they say, I'm not coming back and listening to that anymore. I want to thank all of you for being here today, like we talked about yesterday. Other than military services, the highest civic duty you can do. And this is based, this is democracy in action, okay? This is what makes our country so great. I appreciate it. My partner, Jim Barnes, appreciate it. And most importantly, this young lady right here appreciates it because you're giving her what she asked for, her day, days in court, okay? And no matter what your decision is at the end of this week, we want to thank, uh, thank you for being here today for your service. Now, the prosecution has laid out what this particular portion of the Proceedings is, is uh, it's kind of like a roadmap of where we're going to go. Okay, uh, the prosecution because they have the burden of, of proof, they go first. Okay, that's their case in chief. Afterwards, the defense, should we choose to do so, we put on our case in chief. As the prosecutor mentioned earlier, they will have a rebuttal, and we have closing arguments. Judge Duncan's going to give you the final instructions. Finally, you get to do your job. Okay, if you will, though, try to listen as we go through this. And most of our a lot of the information that we're going to be deriving comes from cross-examination by me and direct examination by Mr. Barnes, who's going to handle the bulk of our case in chief. Please remember, as we go through this, as you listen to these witnesses, the presumption of innocence, which remains with brief throughout the entire proceedings, until and unless, after everything's done, you've heard everything from both sides, jury instructions, arguments, until you're convinced, beyond the exclusion of every reason without, that she did what this prosecutor claims she did. So please try to keep open mind. Another thing the judge is going to tell you, don't leave your common sense outside the door when you walk in here today, when you're going through this. Now, I know this prosecutor well enough to know he's not going to intentionally mislead you. I'm sure not going to do that, and neither is Jim Barnes. 
but this is an adversarial process, okay? They've got their version of the facts. We've got our version of the facts, okay? And I want you to listen carefully as we go through this and listen to which the questions I'm asking, the responses we're getting, the questions that Jim's going to post to our witnesses probably late tomorrow, and the answers they give as well, as well as these experts. And remember, the burden of proof remains with the prosecution. That can come from what we're going to hear here today, tomorrow, the evidence, or we have exhibits, testimony, a lack of evidence, what you're not going to hear, and a conflict in the evidence. Prosecutors already, already told you we've got conflicts in the evidence already from the get-go. Remember, all you've got to do is find one reasonable doubt, and you're going to have to vote not guilty if you follow the law that Judge Duncan's going to give you. Okay? Remember what my client is charged with. First degree premeditated murder. As we go through this testimony, think to yourself, what kind of person calls the police out to their house if they're going to commit a premeditated murder? You're going to hear that police, law enforcement, have been called out to that residence. But several of the witnesses are going to talk about it. But at least five times before, use your own common sense as you go through this. How many times have most people ever had a cop car out of their house? Zero. This lady's had to have cops out there in these five towns, it sounds like. Does that sound like a good relationship to you? Absolutely not. This woman was a Navy chief petty officer. She started out with security, okay, in peace. Then she became a recruiter, but she did exactly what they tell her to do, what she was trained to do. Call the cops when you need help. That's what she did. But what did they do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Each time we came out there, they did zero. I anticipate you're going to hear testimony from Bree that she closed this garage door because she was afraid of what Colin was going to do. You're going to hear testimony from her about what this man did to her. You need to know this. You're going to find out during this case is that he was 100% disabled. He didn't retire from the service. He quit. He had traumatic brain injury. He had issues with his brain. You're going to hear Bree say, you're unstable. You're a danger to the kids. This is on tape. She's saying this. So we're not talking about a normal person here. And this is the dynamics that was happening there. He didn't do anything. He was supposed to be at home studying. All he did was stay in his room all the time. These kids were running out there by themselves. You'll hear testimony from Bree. They weren't clothed properly. They weren't fed properly. The house was a wreck. This guy was in his room in his own little world the entire time. This woman was out, you're going to hear testimony. She would work from like 7 o'clock in the morning sometimes till 1 o'clock in the morning the next day to try to make ends meet. He wasn't doing squat. She was the breadwinner, and all she got from him was abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse. She got raped repeatedly. They were stationed in North Carolina. She was raped up there when she was up there. And when they got back here to Florida, she got raped again. <clears throat> and that's going to come into play when you hear from Dr. Harper. What people do after repeated abuse over and over and over again. And when she tried to call law enforcement to help, they didn't do anything. What the prosecutor conveniently forgot to tell you is that this man kept hand guns on him at all times. That day, the day of the incident, he had guns in the truck. The truck he's going to take these kids out with. He had threatened to kill these kids before. And her as well. This was his third marriage, okay? You're going to hear testimony that every one of them happened to be red-haired. He had told her that I'm not, this marriage is not going to end unless it's going to end the way he wanted it to end. That's what this woman was worried about. That's the testimony you're going to hear. She was worried that she was, he was going to take the kids and kill them and her in, as well as we're going down. Let's all go down together. This is not a normal man that she was dealing with. The question's going to come and the testimony's going to be how far do you have to go before you let somebody hurt you or your children? How far does a mother allow someone? to terrify her, threaten to kill her children before she takes action. This man told the cops on one of the conversations, I've got guns in my car. So there's absolutely no doubt that he had guns in that car. She knew it. He was going to take those kids and do God knows what them. There was already two trips out to that house before the incident ever happened, and not a dang thing was done. That's the testimony you're going to hear. Not a dang thing was done. 
Now, just because her testimony is going to be that she got pushed to the floor, she got slammed into the wall, well, there was no marks. The, the testimony is going to be you don't have to have marks to get hurt, okay? You don't have to get marks to be threatened. You don't have to get marks to take your kids and kill your kids. This is not a, the testimony. Going to, this is not an ordinary Joe out there that we're dealing with, okay? This man had 100% disability for brain problems, TBI, traumatic brain injury. That's what you're going to hear. You're also going to hear in this call that this man claimed that she was trying to break his arm. Well, you're not going to hear any testimony whatsoever from this medical examiner. There was anything wrong with this man's arm. This is another one of the lies of this guy's perpetrator throughout the entire. Thank you very much. May. You'll make the final decision, okay, as to who's telling the truth. You're also going to find out from the medical examiner that this man had amphetamines in his system. Well, you want to make me approach again? No. You're going to hear testimony. I'm sorry. You're going to hear testimony that you can't lock somebody in a garage. Okay, it's not possible. What you're also going to hear is that this man snatched her baby girl out of her arms to take her to the truck where his guns were. Every single witness you're going to hear that were there at the day, both the neighbors that are going to testify to you as well as law enforcement, I'm going to tell you this woman was in shock. Absolutely, and understandably so. And as we go through the testimony, please look at that in relation to the battered spouse syndrome that Dr. Harper was talking about and some of the trauma that she's that's happened to her since early childhood until now, what she's gone through. Because you'll see, and we, when we get to the closing jury instructions, you got to see what one of the Things you have to do, the analysis you got to go through is what she thought at the time. Not what y'all thought, not what I thought, not what he thought, what going through her mind when she made the decision to shoot him. You want to maybe approach? As I said, every witness that you're going to hear, both law enforcement and lay witnesses, are going to tell you that Bree was in shock that day. You're going to hear that Bree asked Deputy Metzler um, and Major Brinkman as well, is he alive? They even had EMS check on her because she was in shock. You're going to hear she made the statement, hopefully I just shot him, he's not dead. Bree also asked Major Brinkman, please tell me he's still alive. Now, her brother's going to come up here tomorrow and testify that she was on the phone with him. And she, he's going to testify that during the conversation, it sounded like she was being assaulted. Okay, once again, that's consistent with exactly what 
She told Dr. Harper what she's going to tell you tomorrow as well. Her brother Eric's also going to tell you that Bree was afraid for the children's safety and that Colin had threatened to kill the children before. Okay, sometimes you think people take it a little bit too far. This man is dead. He was killed by his wife, the mother of his children. He was a loving, caring father. <coughs> Excuse me. And they want to portray him as someone that's evil that would do bad things, harm children, harm her. All because she got mad because she wanted to watch TV when everybody else in the house was sleeping. And exploded into this. He also is going to testify that he, he knew Colin. He recognized his voice, recognized his voice over the phone, and Bree told him that he was hitting her. She was getting hit. Now, one of these videos that the prosecutor uh, alluded to, you're going to hear and see Bree tell you this, okay? You'll be able to see this. This is not good for the kids. Once again, Mama Bear taking care of her cubs. This is not good for the kids. Can we stop this and talk about it? I want you to leave the house. You are unstable. I don't trust you with the kids. You're on disability for being unstable. This is the testimony you're going to hear. This is the type of man we're talking about. Now, in addition, you're going to hear testimony from law enforcement that Bree told them exactly where that firearm was. She didn't try to hide it. She didn't try to run. She didn't try to flee. What she did is took the kids to the neighbor for safety and came back and, and spoke to 911. She didn't try to jump in the car and run or anything else. She didn't have anything to run from. That's what the test was going to be. She did what she thought she had to do to protect herself and protect her children. She related the fear to her brother, Eric, of what Colin was capable of doing to her children. She'd been slammed against the wall that day, pushed, punched on the day of the incident, was being hit again by Colin when she was talking to Eric. She's going to testify about the abuse she suffered at this man's hands for the three years they were together, which included domestic violence, battery, and multiple rapes. I want you to remember the things that we spoke about yesterday about the burden of proof, which remains with the prosecution. After you've had the opportunity to hear our witnesses, to hear our side of the story, and that's what we're asking you to keep your mind open, please, until we get to the end, okay? Have you heard Mr. Barnes go through direct testimony? Listen to the prosecution's rebuttal. It'll finally, it'll be your chance to do your job. We're going to have to listen to us up here. <coughs> But if you follow the law, if you follow the rules, the instructions of the judge and the view, there's absolutely no doubt what your verdict's gonna have to be. Because remember, you can't probably find your guilty more likely than not. But I had yes, I had a bet, Etheridge, I had to flip a coin. No, you've got to be convinced beyond the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got reasonable doubt all over this courtroom today through the rest of the week. You're gonna hear it, you're gonna see it. I'm gonna ask you to do the right thing, follow the law, and vote on guilty. Thank you. See you. Randy Etheridge appearing on behalf of Bree Kuhn. You know, this is a motion to set bond. Now I'm aware as an officer of the court that in this case, not entitled to a bond on capital felony, but uh, at her request and her family's request, we brought this forward just to bring up some issues to the court for okay, sure. consideration. Uh, Mr. Alderman and I have already gotten together about presentation of proof. There was a previous uh, motion, Your Honor, done by Mr. Barnes. And I believe the court found that there was um, sufficient evidence to go forward uh, as far as burden of proof at stake. So we can see that and um, we'll let the court take judicial notice of the first hearing we had uh, before the Your Honor. I may have a client's warning, Your Honor, but I might take some brief testimony. All right. Your Honor. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that this one gives the truth, whole truth, none of the truth, except we got? Yes, sir. All right. Would you state your full name for the record, please, Bree? Bree Christine Hill. How old are you now, Bree? 36. Okay. Uh, and 
Yeah, you've been continuously incarcerated at Santa Rosa County Jail since your arrest on September 8, 2021. Yes, sir. The conditions that you're experiencing now at Santa Rosa County Jail, do they include that you're confined to a solitary confinement segregation? Yes, sir. Do you have access to televisions or radios or any other type of media? No, sir. Okay. Before this particular uh, charge that's been alleged against you, do you have any pr prior criminal uh, history whatsoever? No, sir. Okay. You haven't failed to appear before any court-related process? No, sir. 